Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm John Allen. I'm the president of the Brookings Institution, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you all today to this important event, Women in Afghanistan and the Role of U.S. Support. Today, Afghanistan is at a critical juncture as the Biden administration seeks to determine its policy objectives in the country. Uh, almost a year ago, at the end of February 2020, the Biden administration, sorry, the Trump administration signed a deal with the Taliban to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan in May 2021. This was in exchange for the Taliban agreeing to counter terrorism commitments, reducing violence, severing its ties with Al Qaeda, guaranteeing no terrorist attacks against the United States and its allies, uh, and guaranteeing that they would not originate from Afghanistan. Now, I'll hasten to add that virtually none of these obligations by the Taliban had a distinct, transparent, measurable outcome, while U.S. commitments were concrete. The Taliban also committed itself to beginning separate so-called intra-Afghan peace negotiations with the Afghan government about a future Afghanistan in which uh, Taliban seeks uh, to have a prominent role. Uh, with their stated objective being its transformation over time into an Islamic emirate. A year later, the Taliban Afghan government negotiations that finally began in the September of 2020 timeframe remained stalled in only the initial phases. The comprehensive ceasefire that the Afghan government had hoped would follow uh, remains elusive and very high violence continues in 2020 and through January 2021, killing hundreds of innocent Afghans and members of the Afghan National Security Forces. Targeted assassinations of civil society members, judges, uh, and also specific targeting of Afghan women have devastated Kabul and other places within the country. And at the same time, the Taliban have not severed its connections to Al Qaeda. Just this week, an airstrike in the Helmand province killed members of a joint Al Qaeda Taliban planning cell preparing for terror operations in that province. Important to today's event, a massive question mark now hangs over the fate of Afghan women and their rights as the Biden administration assess, assesses whether to maintain U.S. forces in Afghanistan beyond May 2021, a force which currently stands at 2,500. Current options are limited and suboptimal, and a rapid withdrawal of U.S. military forces from Afghanistan undercuts the entire international mission to the country and would severely destabilize the Afghan government, worsening, in my mind, the dangers most Afghan women continue to face in terms of insecurity and violence and the lack of services and job opportunities. This much is clear. And while the Taliban have seemed to soften their rhetoric towards women, we should treat that with the same skepticism as their commitment to sever their ties to Al Qaeda. Indeed, women in Afghanistan face many challenges to their rights, and to their opportunities. And they face these challenges from men of all types, including not just those in the Taliban, but also government officials, government corruption, and predatory and rapacious behavior associated with government-linked power brokers and warlords. Furthermore, an open-ended US military commitment to maintain forces until a good peace deal is reached, an outcome that could easily take years may force the Taliban to walk away from the negotiations. And this is a risk, frankly, that both sides must weigh very heavily. Regardless of which path the Biden administration takes, how Afghanistan and its political order is ultimately redesigned is left almost entirely up to the negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government and other Afghan officials, power brokers, and hopefully representatives from the Afghan civil society. Now, in my mind, very sadly, the Trump administration abrogated its responsibility to Afghan women and more broadly to the international community when it left the fate of Afghan women in the intra-Afghan peace negotiations without establishing a US and international expectation for how the ultimate peace plan would guarantee the safety and the rights of Afghan women, which were obtained at such a great price to this point. It would be difficult to overstate how terribly women have suffered at the hands of the Taliban and how much in relative terms the conditions for them have improved during the period of the US and NATO involvement. Here in my view, the United States maintains a strong policy focus on women's rights in the country, and it has to do so just as it did during the NATO period. 
And though the final outcome is up to the Afghan people, the US and the international community must play a central role in ensuring the safety and the prosperity of Afghan women going forward. As has been said in Afghanistan, women hold up half the sky and we must not abandon them at this most pressing hour. So with that, I am delighted to introduce the Special Investigator, uh, Special Investigator General for Afghan Reconstruction, John F. Sopko, who's joining us today to deploy his work, his most recent report from the Office of the Special Investigator General for Afghan Research, Afghan <laughs> Reconstruction, a report entitled Support for Gender Equality. And John, this is some of your very best work. I have to thank you sincerely for that. Mr. Sopko was appointed by the Obama administration in 2012, and he has spent eight years on Afghanistan reconstruction. And through that work and his tireless leadership has recovered more than $3.8 billion on behalf of the US government. He's a leading expert on Afghanistan. A long, long career in the law. He was 30 years a prosecutor, a congressional counsel, and a senior federal advisor. John, it's wonderful to have you with us today. And I'll turn the floor over to you in just a moment for your opening remarks. But I wanna remind everyone we're very much live. We're gonna be recorded. And for those who wanna add questions to our list today, please contact us at events at brookings.edu. So with that, John, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today and using us as the platform to deploy this very important report. The floor is yours, sir. And you're muted, sir. John, you're muted. Well, I may be the special inspector general, but I'm not a technician. So I apologize for that. Um, thank you very much for those kind comments, General. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I wanna thank you uh, as well as uh, Dr. Vonda Felba Brown for inviting us to release the report today and to discuss what I think may be one of the most important reports we have released. The report, which is entitled Support for Gender Equality Lessons from the U.S. Experience in Afghanistan is the first comprehensive and independent U.S. government analysis of all of our efforts to support gender equality in Afghanistan. It examines all of our efforts since 2002 to improve the lives and advance the rights of Afghan women and girls. Why is this report important? I think, General, you have alluded to it. Today, the NATO defense ministers are meeting about their role, continuing role. And as we release it today, we know the new Biden administration is conducting its own review of US policy in Afghanistan, which I am certain will include the critical issue of how the United States can continue to support Afghan women and girls at such a time of great uncertainty about their country's future. This key question is vitally important in the context of peace negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban. And the answer may determine whether the successes, and there have been successes, and investment in improving the lives of Afghan women and girls will be remembered as a lasting legacy or just another historical footnote in this poor country called Afghanistan. As you can probably tell from already from my presentation, I am very proud of this report. And I'm even prouder of the Lessons Learned program, which produced it. And as many of the audience may not know, it was you, General Allen, among others, who suggested to me a number of years ago that SIGAR initiate a Lessons Learned program. I think you knew that SIGAR was the only independent agency with the statutory authority to look at the whole of government effort in Afghanistan and reconstruction, as well as the initiative and the personnel on the ground to do so. Apropos of that, as the US embassy personnel and the US military presence have been downsized over the last year, I'm pleased to say that SIGAR is the only office of general 
still operating on the ground in Afghanistan with the personnel to continue this mission. Now, we undertook this report because advancing the status of, uh, and rights of women and girls has been an important goal of US reconstruction since the beginning. While it was not the reason the United States and its coalition partners went to war, promoting women's rights in Afghanistan has become a rallying cry for the continuation of both civilian and military presence. One need only watch the recent US Senate confirmation hearings for Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin to realize the importance of this issue to US policymakers, especially the Congress, where nearly every question about Afghanistan asked and emphasized the need to protect the rights of women and girls there. Turning to the report itself, Beyond looking at just US programs and interviewing over three dozen current and former US and Afghan government officials and outside experts, we at SIGAR felt it was necessary that this report highlights the voices of Afghans themselves, especially Afghans who live outside Kabul. And I'm glad to see as part of the presentation today, we have two very special uh, guests who will be at the uh, panel following us. Accordingly, SIGAR itself commissioned field interviews, and we interviewed 65 Afghans, both male and female, located in provinces throughout the country. They represent a wide range of Afghan society and viewpoints, from parliamentarians to internally displaced persons. And I think their participation in this report truly makes it unique. The experiences they shared with us are particularly important as the story of women in Afghanistan is more complex than the simplistic portrait often painted of either mini skirted wearing women in 1970s era Kabul or passive victims forced to wear burqas and sub subjug sub subjugated to the will of Islamic fundamentalists. As we note in the report, and this is very important, that such one-dimensional narratives can undermine even the most well-intentioned efforts to ensure women and girls are afforded basic human rights. A task whose difficulty is best summarized up with the realization that there are no words in Dari or Pashtu for gender or gender equality. Now, as the report shows, the US investment to support the rights of Afghan women and girls has been significant. SIGAR's analysis found that the US government had disbursed at least $787 million for activity primarily intended to support Afghan women. And almost certainly more money was spent as roughly 100 additional US programs included a gender component of some kind. Unfortunately, we found that the, those efforts yielded mixed results. On the one hand, considerable investment across a range of sectors contributed to indisputable gains, especially in education and maternal health care. SIGAR found that there was broad demand from the Afghans themselves for these services and US agencies were responded with well-designed and effective programs. Yet SIGAR's examination of the 24 major programs in dealing with women and girls uh, revealed some serious shortcomings. Some programs were designed on a, and based on assumptions that proved to be ill-suited to the Afghan context. We also found that establishing a correlation between program activities and related outcomes was not always possible. And insufficient monitoring and evaluation of program activities often made it impossible to assess program impact. Now, this is something that we have found throughout the whole reconstruction field in our work over the last 10 years. It, additionally, as our report notes, a frequent critique of aid programs in Afghanistan has been the failure to take local context 
including cultural norms into consideration. Moreover, while high level political attention on gender issues by Congress and three different administrations translated into significant funding to these efforts, the level of political attention may also have led to reduced scrutiny of many programs. But despite this, the report found that the importance of US backing for Afghan women's rights should not be underestimated in and of itself. Afghan women repeatedly told our staff that the vocal support by the United States and the international actors was a key factor in advancing their rights and their participation in public life. But despite these successes, our report reminds us we cannot be naive about the challenges that the women and girls of Afghanistan continue to face to this day. And General, you alluded to the problems. It's not just the Taliban, it's also the warlords and its corrupt government officials and many other problems. Make no mistake, though they have achieved greater access to health care and education and work as legislators, judges, teachers, health workers, civil servants, journalists, and business and civil society leaders, Afghanistan still remains one of the most challenging places in the world to be a woman. These challenges notwithstanding, the question now facing you as policymakers is how to protect those gains that we have made. And as our report notes, the effort to promote women's rights in Afghanistan may also be hampered by a new narrative a narrative that the country can either have women's rights at the cost of peace or peace at the cost of women's rights. I do not believe gender equality is a zero sum game, nor does this report find it as so. The US can and should continue to play a role in shaping an outcome that preserves gains made by Afghan women and girls by advocating now and continually advocating that Afghan women have a meaningful role in the peace process and not just window dressing. And that any future agreement includes strong protections for them. Clearly, US policymakers should consider conditioning US assistance to any future Afghan government, whether it includes the Taliban or not, on that government's demonstrated commitment to the protection of the rights of women and girls. Likewise, the US government should also consider strongly encouraging the other donors to include like and similar conditions. These actions deserve consideration in order to protect the investment the United States has made in the Afghan women who now serve throughout the country as educators politicians, entrepreneurs, and healthcare workers. These women in turn, we must remember, have hopes that their daughters will have opportunities that they could never have imagined two decades ago. So remember, the US investment in the women of Afghanistan is an investment in Afghanistan's future. And we should not forget the bitter lesson we learned from our previous withdrawal from Afghanistan. Cutting our support to those whom we have previously encouraged to rise up can lead to tragedy, not only for them, but for us. So let me close by saying the, there is a link to the report at www.cigar.mil. You can see the full report as well as an interactive version of the report. But before turning over to questions, General, I want to personally express my deep appreciation to the SIGAR team who produced the report, to Kate Bateman, who is here today, who led this effort for over the last two years, did a tremendous job, to Samantha Hay, to Miriam Jalalzadeh, to Sarah Rababi, Matthew Rubin, Haley Rose, Nikolai Kandi Padunov, Tracy Content, Vong Lim, Jason Davis, 
And of course, Joe Windrum, who is the Lessons Learned Program Director. Without them, and I know it was a team effort, without them, this report would not have been possible. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to the rest of the program. Well, John, thank you very much. Uh, those remarks were terrific. I think they're right on target, right spot on, as you say. We're having the defense minister's conversation right now uh, at NATO, and really important subjects are afoot with them. Now, John, you and I first crossed paths um, in, uh, I think, 2012 yes. uh, in Afghanistan, and I want to thank you uh, in all those years uh, since then for the great work that you have done. Thank you. Uh, and that work has not only saved our country a lot with respect to uh, the manner in which we have undertaken reconstruction, it's also recovered a lot, but in this lessons learned project, which you have undertaken and personally led, uh, we won't make these mistakes again because these lessons learned are extraordinarily important. And this report may be some of the very best work that you've ever done. So I wanna thank your team also, because it's not just good for us in the United States, it's gonna be good right now in this critical moment for the women of Afghanistan. And I, I wanna thank you for that. Now, I've got several questions and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Vonda Felbaugh Brown, who will be having a conversation with a panel. Uh, but you know, many observers, John, fear that what happens, uh, what will happen if the Taliban assume a significant role in the Afghan government. We know that they have said they want to see the government trend ultimately towards being an Islamic uh, emirate. Um, but we don't know what that means in the context of how women will ultimately be treated within that society. Uh, as you have gone through this work and as uh, Kate and others have put this report together, what are your thoughts on, what is your assessment of what the future of the Afghan women will look like in this peace process uh, during the process and after? That, that is the ultimate question and we don't have a firm answer. I mean, sure. Kate will tell you, you know, what we learned and all of that. And I know you and Dr. Felba Brown did an excellent article last year in which you talked about some of those main issues. Actually, it's very simpatico between the two of us, but I'm very concerned. Um, you know, not only have I not met a woman in Afghanistan who trusts the Taliban, I haven't met many men who trust the Taliban in Afghanistan. Now, I've only talked to people in Kabul with the major cities, but overall, there's a great concern. Um, you know, the Taliban talks that they have changed, but uh, have they? Uh, a lot of their rhetoric still is conditioned on, we believe in rights for women, uh, but um, uh, under Islamic law or under Sharia, what does that mean? They haven't defined it. And the sad thing is in this, uh, with you call it a peace agreement, I call it a withdrawal agreement that was signed uh, a year ago and you make reference to, there's no reference to protecting human rights or That's protecting right. the democracy that was created or protecting the constitution or protecting women. So we walk into this and the Afghans walk into this with, if with trepidation. So I can't give you a definitive answer. Maybe Kate can give you more. There have been people talking out in the countryside to Afghan women and men in areas that the Taliban have controlled, but it's mixed results. Some Taliban are really enforcing it. Some are violating human rights. The UN has identified a number of instances of that. Others, it hasn't been as bad. We just don't know. And that is the situation we're in. John, we, we have had uh, mixed success when we've dealt with the Taliban and Taliban leadership have sought to convey that they actually can control uh, the Taliban. And my own experience as the commander there was you, you had those who uh, sought to exert um, the appearance of leadership. Uh, and then you found that Taliban uh, elements in the field uh, didn't feel so constrained as to follow that leadership or even to have their own programs completely apart uh, from how the, if you will, the uh, Peshawar uh, uh, Shura, uh, might have actually de dealt with them or the Quetta Shura might have dealt with them. So the issue I think becomes uh, as we move forward uh, with a peace agreement, how might the United States, and you address this slightly, how might the United States and the international community actually 
demonstrate a real and unambiguous commitment in the aftermath of this process uh, to preserving the rights of women and protecting women going forward? What, what options and tools does the United States and the international community have to do that, John? Well, f first of all, what they really need to do is we need to be advocating and advocating repeatedly, repeatedly in every meeting uh, uh, the need to protect these rights and also protect the constitution of Afghanistan and protect uh, 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 not only the women and girls, but you know certain liberties for everybody in there. Uh, the, the, the biggest tool we really have, other than just the advocacy, is the fact that the, both the Taliban and the Afghan government need and want external monetary support. Right. And this is a point I have been making, and I think, General, the first time you and I met, we talked about this conditionality, smart conditionality, putting conditions on it. Right now, and just so I have my figures straight, I think the World Bank estimates that the Afghan government right now raises about $2.6 billion. Just to pay for the military every year, it's nine to $10 billion. Uh, or is it nine to 10 billion total? So th there's a shortfall. They need assistance. The Taliban say they want continued support from the foreign governments. It should be a strict condition. If you don't follow these rules, if you don't protect the women and girls, you don't get the money and we walk away. You know, conditionality as you and I have had this conversation is being brave enough to say no and being brave enough to pull it back. So I hope we do that and I hope our allies keep that in mind. That's one of the things we recommend. The other thing is if we do continue, we have I think 17 various recommendations, all of them should improve the rights of women or at least maintain it. I mean, we definitely cannot ignore the gains we made in education and health. And so that needs to be funded, but that's gotta be conditioned on them respect. And by them, I mean the Taliban and the corrupt government officials respecting the rights of women and girls. John, you, you've talked about our allies and I've used the term international community. Uh, often that, uh, that becomes very quickly a conversation about NATO, mm -hmm. but there are other countries that have equities uh, in the outcome, a, a, a genuine peace uh, and a peace where Afghan women play a role in the future, a constructive role, an, an important role. Um, can you talk a little bit about the larger community, the larger international community that has interests, uh, that have an interest in Afghanistan that, that the United States ought to be leveraging? And I think China, for example, or Russia. Could you talk a little bit about your views in that regard? Well. You know, our report doesn't discuss it in great details beyond it, but I mean, re reality is Afghanistan isn't is, doesn't sit in a void. It's surrounded by countries that all have some concern about the future of Afghanistan. You know, unfortunately, our relations with most of those countries, by ours, I mean the United States, it, it is not the most positive. So. Uh, you know, China is very interested in what happens down there. It's in, worried about terrorism. Well, you know, I don't need to go over a chapter and verse of about the last administration's dealing with China. It's not as if they seem to be very cooperative with us on this issue. Uh, Russia, borders, you have the stands in between, but Russia is a, a strong player. Uh, again, our relationship hasn't been great, and I don't know if it will could be great. Uh, Iran, well, we don't even talk to them. So the players around there are all interested, but how do we, and again, we didn't discuss this, and this isn't something that's in my purview, but obviously the diplomatic issue is extremely important. And you know, I think, General, you and I talked about this. This, this issue is not going to be won on the battlefield. It's going to be diplomacy. But we have to make it a priority for our diplomats that they can deal with these other countries who have an interest in peace in that part of the world. 
What is what is your advice if, if you were to be asked for your advice about the American presence in Afghanistan going forward? Uh, is there a strong uh, rationale for retaining a military presence for some period of time? Uh, and what's the risks? What are the risks if we pull that military presence out? Well, as an inspector general, I, 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 we haven't done it, so I can't say I speak as the inspector general. Um, but uh, everybody we've talked to has said is if there is a quick withdrawal, the if the troops leave suddenly, uh, uh, Afghanistan will be in deep trouble militarily. If the funding is cut, uh, I've said this before, it, all the experts tell us that the government will probably collapse. So they need that funding. I, I told you the Delta is extremely big and they, they need it. So I'm cautious about a, a sudden withdrawal, but again, I didn't participate. Nobody in my staff were even briefed. They wouldn't even brief us on the peace negotiation. And I think a lot of people in Congress weren't even briefed on it for a long time. So I don't know if there are any secret uh, 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 codicils to that that may be covered, but, but I, I'm very concerned. I think this violence that we've seen over the last year or last couple of years, but particularly over the last year, really causes us all some concern about whether the Afghan military and police uh, uh, can hold their own. And I think in part, I think morale has been affected by uh, uh, some of the actions that our country has taken and some of the statements that were made by senior uh, US government officials about Afghanistan. I mean, I mean, I hate to use the term, uh, the phrase that John Kerry once said, do you wanna be the last GI to die in Vietnam? But I mean, do you wanna be the last Afghan soldier to die fighting for a corrupt regime and uh, the US is walking out the door. Morale is an important thing to consider. Nobody talks about that. But when you make a statement or tweet something out, it has an impact. Right. You know, uh, People criticize me for issuing my reports saying, oh, you're hurting the morale. But I mean, I write audit reports and uh, lessons learned reports. Uh, we it's it's a precarious situation I think we face, General, and uh, you probably know it better than I do, having worked over there uh, as ISAF commander. Morale can be destroyed yes. uh, by uh, uh, not only statements but policies that aren't coordinated with the host government. Well, your views obviously carry an awful lot of weight, and your reports have done so much, I think, to season our thinking today, but also the, the thinking of our future leadership. And one of the reasons that I asked the question about our troops is what a lot of people need to understand and the audience should understand today, and you've touched on it several times as I have as well, it's not just American troops that are in Afghanistan. You know, we went in with a large international contingent to operate on behalf of the Afghan people and to stabilize the Afghan government for a future of representative government. And the presence of those troops creates the environment of confidence amongst the Afghan people, but it also creates a confidence among our allies to continue the very important support that you talked about. Continue to support the program for women and girls and continue to support civil society. And so pulling out 2,500 troops might sound like a small decision, it's really a huge decision because when the Americans go, the rest of the allies will go. And when the rest of the allies go, the international support will go. So these things are extraordinarily important. And one of the points that I made to Hamid Karzai when I would see him on a regular basis in the palace was that Afghanistan, if it ever seeks to transition from being a conflict society to a developing society, one half the population has got to be involved. He has got to get the women involved in the development of the society and protect that part of the population that holds up half the sky. That can only happen in my mind and I know in your mind as well, if we stay and if we are able to sustain that kind of support. Yeah. So John, I wanna thank you for your work. I wanna thank you for the great efforts that the Special Investigator General 
for Afghanistan Reconstruction has done for so many years, not just the office, but your personal leadership. And thank you for being with us today. And I'll offer you the floor for any final comments before I transition to Dr. Feldbaum Brown. No, I just wanna thank you for your leadership, not only as a great general in the field, but also since taking over Brookings. These are the kind of issues and it gives us an opportunity to have this type of discussion so that Congress and the government administration, it doesn't matter what political party, can actually flesh out some of the key issues that we, they need to make decisions on. So thank you. Thank you. There are a few issues right now more important than the future of women in Afghanistan. So thank you, John. And over to you, Dr. Vonda Felbob brown And thank you for your great work on this area. And please lead us in this next panel. Well, thank you very much, uh, General Allen. Um, it's uh, always a delight to share a panel event with you. And uh, I am enormously grateful to uh, your commitment to Afghanistan and to women in Afghanistan, uh, which has indeed been inspirational. And it was a great pleasure to uh, author the paper that uh, Mr. Sopko kindly mentioned um, with you on the fate of uh, women's rights in Afghanistan, an issue that we are all discussing today. And I look very much forward to moving to our panel and particularly to uh, uh, great uh, uh, representatives of, of women from Afghanistan, uh, as well as Kate, whom I'll introduce just in a moment. Let me also um, thank uh, Mr. Sopko for his work, uh, for uh, uh, speaking truth to power and uh, uh, diligently looking at a wide range of issues regarding uh, counterinsurgency and stabilization effort, including uh, the latest um, uh, paper, the latest report on um, Afghan women and US assistance efforts. Uh, you know, one of the issues I appreciate about the report, and then I think it's really fundamental about uh, uh, discussing effectively and helping effectively to protect and promote um, women's rights and progress in Afghanistan is to focus on complexity and focus on nuance, move beyond black and white um, uh, portrayals of, uh, on the one hand, uh, the tremendous brutality that women in Afghanistan face uh, and have endured uh, and the challenges they continually face and, and uh, seemingly the simplicity of progress. Um, as we have heard uh, today uh, repeatedly, uh, the progress uh, has been very important but also highly unequal. And the challenges and complexities come uh, from many directions. In a very simple um, uh, uh, complexity or line of complexity is of course the divide between rural spaces and urban spaces and particularly several large urban areas such as Kabul, Jalalabad, Kunduz, Pahlan, Mazar, Herat, where uh, women uh, have been able to avail themselves of the constitutional rights, legal rights and economic opportunities to a far greater extent than women in other parts of the country, certainly in the rural areas, but also uh, in other uh, towns and other cities like Tirinkot or um, Kalat. Another line, of course, is between areas that are ruled by the Taliban, increasingly wider space, and areas uh, that are not, with different types of challenges and complexities emerging there. By and large, uh, uh, the access to rights and economic and other opportunities in areas controlled by the Taliban is much lesser than in areas that's controlled by the government. But again, there is great variation as was already uh, indicated based on particular uh, Taliban commanders, shadow or district governors, and a whole wide uh, uh, other set of issues. How predatory and rapacious are the power brokers associated with the government in the particular area? What kind of ethnic uh, tribal minority a woman uh, might belong to? Often areas where the Taliban uh, operates are known still for very brutal punishments for issues such as adultery. Yet there are very many women in Afghanistan who are in prison um, as a result of the legal judicial process uh, that uh, Afghanistan embarked on after 2002 for uh, so-called moral crimes, 
such as running away from abusive husbands or defending themselves against physical brutality from their husbands, fathers, or brothers, yet they'll end up being uh, imprisoned. Um, while they exact brutality and limit the rights of women in many ways, Taliban courts also often far better guarantee inheritance rights to women and property rights under Sharia than legal courts in Afghanistan, which often are very slow and uh, corrupt, with male relatives being far in a better position to corrupt the court to get uh, judicial outcomes um, favorable to them that disherit women and take um, uh, money away from them. We have heard also about the dichotomy of war or peace versus women's rights and indeed the complexities of that. Um, yet, of course, war is experienced in very different ways and in different consequences in rural or urban spaces. Uh, all those whose relatives and friends are killed, uh, of course, tremendously suffer a great trauma in multiple ways. And we are seeing uh, really an egregious and awful um, assassination campaign in um, uh, in um, Kabul and several other places that have also targeted women, uh, judges, uh, and others. Uh, but, but often it is in rural areas where uh, the, the, the daily suffering, the daily deaths and injuries are far higher than in urban spaces, and where um, it is uh, the rural women that experience the loss of male relatives as a result of fighting. And when male relatives are lost, um, that might mean that a woman uh, and her children, particularly female uh, offsprings, they lose all access to any kind of social economic opportunities. Not surprisingly, uh, many women in rural areas are um, uh, already unable to access the nominal legal um, uh, rights that exist. Uh, are very eager to see a cessation of hostility and end to fighting, even perhaps uh, under a Taliban rule. They might already be experiencing a Taliban rule and sometimes even a brutal and predictable Taliban rule might be easier to develop coping mechanisms for than unpredictable, rapacious and capricious uh, rule and brutality uh, perpetrated by um, power brokers associated with the Afghan government. So very many complexities that I am now uh, going to ask our panel uh, to address and explore. Uh, but perhaps final line before I introduce our panelists is that it seems fundamental um, uh, for uh, us, uh, for the international community to really focus on the agency of Afghan women. And as we talk about how we guarantee Afghan women's rights, how we preserve them, we need to um, increasingly and, and equally be asking how do we, how do Afghan women uh, uh, embrace their agency and their actions? What is it that they want us to do? How they want us to be of assistance as to what is their agency? And the agency of Afghan women is extraordinarily impressive as is their endurance and survival and has been uh, on uh, display um, uh, not just since 2002, uh, uh, since 2001 and the US intervention, but way before. So um, with that, let me introduce uh, our, our panelists now. Um, uh, first is uh, Kate uh, Bateman, who is uh, the project lead uh, in the Lessons Learned program uh, in the Office of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. Uh, Kate is also the lead author uh, of the report that uh, has uh, just several minutes ago went live on uh, US support for women and gender rights uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, Kay has worked uh, on other reports produced by the CIGAR's office, such as on anti-corruption, counter-narcotics, the integration of ex-combatants, and her analysis has appeared in a variety of uh, prominent publications. She has previously served in intelligence and policy positions at the US Departments of State um, in Washington DC, mm -hmm. in Afghanistan and in Sri Lanka. Next, I am really thrilled to introduce two enormously brave, impressive uh, Afghan women who, uh, uh, in my view, represent uh, the power and agency uh, of Afghan women that I have uh, spoke about. And I'm particularly grateful for their participation as this takes place very late at night 
enormously kind for them to be willing to join us at this hour. Uh, but I'm also very grateful and impressed that we have the opportunity to talk with them, uh, even though they are outside of Kabul. Uh, this is rare uh, these days as insecurity uh, has increased and the Taliban has been ascendant uh, on the battlefield. Uh, more and more uh, civil society actors as well as international actors have collapsed onto Kabul. And so um, Pashtana Durrani and, um, and uh, uh, Belkis Barai are, are two Afghan women who are still operating and engaging in projects uh, uh, outside of Kabul. Uh, Belkis is an engineer by training uh, and she focuses on women development issues and has done so um, for many years. Uh, promoting uh, and helping to uh, implement projects um, funded by uh, USAID. For example, she has been a regional integration manager for rural development uh, in southern Afghanistan, where she has closely worked with women in Kandahar, Helmand, Zabul, and Uruzgan. Uh, and uh, some, much of her work has focused on issues such as promoting sustainable economic growth for uh, rural Afghan women, an absolutely fundamental issue that uh, gives meaning or takes away meaning from the nominal rights uh, uh, that women can enjoy under uh, the existing Afghan constitution. Um, Pashtana Durrani is um, yet another very impressive uh, person, um, a social and political activist, educator, uh, as well as writers such as for outlets uh, like the Kabul Times and the Afghan uh, Times among others. Uh, Pashtana runs a nonprofit uh, organization uh, called LEARN, um, uh, in which she uh, helps educate uh, boys and girls uh, in southern Afghanistan as well on a whole variety of issues, including uh, taboo but absolutely fundamental issues such as menstrual uh, hygiene. And she also uh, engages with uh, uh, the adults, for example, training teachers in uh, digital literacy. She is the global youth representative for Amnesty International and has been awarded the Malala Fund Education Champion Award. And she is also a member of uh, uh, UNDP's um, GF Steering Committee. Thanks uh, to all three of you for joining us today. I am enormously eager uh, to hear your voice. Okay, I'll turn to you first <clears throat> and ask you uh, to give us perhaps a little bit more um, flesh, a little bit more details uh, of the report, some of the key takeaways uh, analytically and in terms of recommendations. Um, sure, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. Thank you to the Brookings Institution um, and especially uh, also to my fellow panelists, to Belkis and Pashtana for sharing your perspectives and um, some ground truth with us. Um, I'd like to start just by setting the context of US efforts. Um, as Mr. Sapko and General Allen uh, discussed, uh, promoting women's rights has, was not the reason uh, in the first place for the US intervention in Afghanistan, but um, it has been a major goal of the reconstruction effort through three administrations. And, and we see that in the nearly $800 million that uh, Mr. Sapka mentioned um, has been you know, put towards uh, this goal. And the US has, uh, has tried to advance women's rights in Afghanistan uh, for two main reasons. I think first, uh, because it's the right thing to do. And two, because policymakers have believed that doing so, that ensuring half the population has greater opportunity, a place in public life, um, that this would mean a more stable and secure Afghanistan, which is in US interests. Um, and the, re the reconstruction effort itself and the reordering of the Afghan state opened a door to donors, including the US, uh, to do what we could to support women and girls. And this is, there's been this high level um, US political attention to the issue. And that resulted in, um, in a high, high level of resources. Um, no other country in the world has seen this level of US resources to elevate women's status. And I don't think that where US efforts fell short, um, it has been for lack of money. Uh, but sometimes we talk about the development effort as if it happened in a vacuum. And I think Fonda's comments um, underscore this as well, as well that, that these development efforts have happened amidst uh, an ongoing war, one in which the US is a party to the conflict. 
And that's why we devote a chapter in the report um, to the war's impact on women. Uh, I think it's important also to at least acknowledge that many Afghan women um, and their views of the United States are probably not shaped only by US development work, um, but rather the way in which they and their families have experienced the war itself. Um, and in addition, insecurity from the war has constrained our development efforts in some areas. Um, so that leads us to the question, what have women's gains been since 20, uh, 2001? Um, one of the key contributions of the report is that we pull together a lot of data on these gains and they are substantial, especially in health education and um, setting, establishing a legal framework for rights and protections for women. I encourage you all to look at the report's main findings uh, for a summary of these gains. And the report also has five chapters that go into, um, into much more detail on the gains and the barriers as well in five sectors, health, education, political participation, access to justice, and economic participation. Uh, within those chapters, um, I will be also discuss women in the media, and, and then we have a separate look at uh, women in the security forces in the army and police. So we also take a very honest look at how the gains have been uneven um, that as Vanda said, rural women and girls have seen far less improvement in their situation. Uh, for example, more than four times as many women died of pregnancy and birth related causes in rural areas than in urban areas um, as of 2014. And I'll shift now um, to say a few things about what we propose that the US should do. Um, and we put forward 17 recommendations. I'll just touch on four of them. At first, in terms of the peace negotiations, we need consistent and clear diplomacy to stay engaged and have a unified voice with our partners. Um, some African women we talked to felt there, there had been some, there's been some equivocation in, in some mixed messaging um, from the US in the last two years uh, in terms of having a bit more hands-off approach in, in our um, um, in terms of leaving, leaving, up, leaving up to intra-Afghan negotiations, this important issue. Um, we also urge that, that the US be a strong voice for women participating in all aspects of the talks, um, not just you know, at the formal table, but in side meetings, in backdoor meetings, there, there are many different venues. And, and then negotiators are consulting with a range of civil society actors who can then bring to the table the views of Afghans outside Kabul. Uh, the US needs to advocate that any future agreement protects the civil and human rights of all Afghans. And an, an important piece of this pressure, um, as Mr. Sapko mentioned, can be conditionality on future aid. Uh, we also uh, point out that women's rights are not just a women's issue. The world should be watching to see that Afghan male negotiators defend women's rights, that female negotiators are playing a meaningful role on all issues because they are at the table after all as representatives of all Afghans. And second, um, we advocate that the US should focus on healthcare and education. Um, these programs have been effective and innovative. The report goes into to much more detail on them. We, we looked closely at a subset of 24 programs out of, out of the more than 100 state and USAID programs that we identified. Um, but these healthcare and education programs have been, um, have been effective. They have met and they have sought to meet an enormous need, there's, but there's still much greater need. And the Afghan population widely supports these efforts. So we think that the US should build on what has been proven to work, especially if aid levels further decline. And, uh, and best case scenario, if there is a reduction in violence, then the US uh, should be prepared to you know, take advantage of doors opening in terms of reaching areas that have been less accessible. Uh, third, agencies should prioritize and fund strong monitoring and evaluation. And one of the reasons we identified for greater success in maternal health and education programs um, was that uh, they had many of them included ongoing assessments that fed into program design that enabled agencies and implementing implementers to adapt and adjust, and that they had strong um, impact evaluations. 
uh, we found several examples where good m and &E, um, led to this learning and made the programming more successful. Uh, USAID's community-based education efforts have been um, a real bright spot in this respect. Fourth, we recommend that US agencies put a greater focus on working with Afghan men and boys as partners on gender equality issues. And some US programs um, did, again, you know, innovative things to put that principle into practice with good effect, but we could certainly uh, be doing this more widely. And lastly, I'd like to share a quote from um, one of the interviews that we commissioned. Um, this was from a woman in Kunar province, and she said, if a woman wants to work, first she will face challenges and disagreement at home. When she convinces her family members after arguing with them for several days, then she will have to face opposition from the community's members, religious leaders, and local elders. There are always going to be people in the community who don't think working or being outside of the house is a good thing for women. This is a man's world and we have to fight to be in it. And I, I chose that quote in, in part because it almost you know, made me think, well, 30, 40 years ago, parts of this could be applied to the United States for sure. Maybe parts of it could still be applied to America. But um, I think it reminds us that gender equality you know, is a multi-generational effort. Um, it require, absolutely requires the involvement of men. And, um, and it is uh, most importantly, perhaps it's Afghan women themselves who have done the hardest work and shown the most courage. And I will stop there and I'll look forward to more discussion. Um, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, it's a great quote, including because it shows that, of course, the challenges to Afghan women come from very many quarters beyond the Taliban. And uh, for many women, including in urban spaces, it is really male relatives who determine whether uh, the woman can access education to what level beyond puberty or not. And if she has education, whether she can uh, implement the education to access uh, the workforce. And we also see that uh, those issues continue to be highly contested with uh, recent surveys showing many men who are not Taliban, who are in urban spaces, increasingly resentful at the number of uh, uh, women in workforce as they uh, suffer unemployment themselves and complain about the, the scope of rights uh, that women have. Um, so very important quote to highlight how much the challenges run. Um, uh, but the, the, the issue of work uh, so fundamental for any kind of uh, empowerment and for giving real meaning to empowerment is something that Belkis, you have uh, been dealing with for uh, many years and you have been dealing with it in the context of rural Afghanistan, southern rural Afghanistan, where the social pressures are often far greater. Um, Belkis, um, uh, over to you, please. Well, it is possible uh, that we have lost uh, Belkis, who uh, is in southern Afghanistan in a difficult place. Uh, I will not say where she is uh, uh, in order to protect her safety, uh, but I know that there have been challenges with um, uh, Wi-Fi signal. So I hope that uh, we will get uh, Belkis back in um, a few minutes. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, perhaps I can uh, turn to you, uh, Pashtana, um, to um, um, speak also about uh, your perspectives, uh, particularly as you too have been uh, uh, organizing a lot of the tremendous activities in southern rural Afghanistan in very far away places uh, that often uh, do not see much of a presence uh, of Western projects. Uh, let alone Western uh, researchers or assessors. So enormously grateful uh, to you, uh, Pashtana, and, and over to you, please. Thank you, Kate and Wanda for that. Um, I, I would just want to start with the fact that uh, when we talk about Afghan women, when we talk about uh, peace negotiations, and especially when we talk about the current political situation, um, the whole um, narrative is to find a, a victim who has become a hero in Afghanistan and has overcome all those challenges and has been to like you know schools and institutions uh, in in you know, far off areas during the Taliban regime and then has like you know got 
got through that and has then got the uh, like you know a voter base and then got the political uh, participation i wouldn't name uh, people or women who would be uh, who uh, have who fit the story but i feel like it's time that we stop uh, with the fact that uh, not every woman has to become a victim in order to get that attention or that um, space in uh, you know in public spaces or in organizations or in government and most importantly if we talk about today if we talk about work and most importantly if we talk about southern afghanistan i feel like it's time for usid for the us government and for the uh, international community to start focusing on education but at the same time if you are funding uh, educational programs maybe start asking questions if the girls are enrolling in schools uh, what are their um, uh, reasons of not staying within schools what is being done that they are not being stay they are not staying in schools well, what is the reason of the dropout the second thing is if there is uh, an issue with not having a clinic what is the alternative way for clinic or the maternal health care like you know we talk about a lot about the gains and women rights and work rights but we don't talk about the fact that helmand is facing the uh, you know the highest mortality rate right now and we are losing women every day and that doesn't mean that we lose just one woman the mother of children you lose one woman the a sister of that same woman has to be married to the same guy where the mother was married to and then at the same time that young girl has to look after the children at the same time she has to uh, she gets impregnated for the second or the third year and that's early child marriage and early child pregnancy so if the international community is donating and funding such programs why are they not asking questions and most importantly about political participation we at the moment we don't have our provincial elections we haven't had them for like you know in the past 6 to 7 years why is the uh, why is the international community not asking questions for that and most importantly what is the reason if women are not getting elected or what is the reason that rural women are not getting elected and most importantly if Uh, we are focusing on like you know funding afghanistan if we are focusing on women rights on gender equality maybe it's time to focus on alternative ways because the ways that I, we have already been working for two decades maybe they are not working and that's the reason that 33 provinces especially the rural areas they have been left out like i come from a um, district called maruf and that area has been left out for two decades we have 43 infrastructural schools and not a single teacher and the salaries are allotted by the nordic countries every year and they get the salaries but there is not a single teacher and we have to focus on alternative ways to learn through digital literacy and at the same time when uh, the international community talks about cso's involved or civil society involved um, they don't uh, involve the actual civil society that is working on the ground they involve the elite ones or the ones that are founded by you know the people in kabul who are related to the elite families or the people in the government maybe it's time to actually uh, involve people on ground and most importantly if the us is like you know trying that uh, trying to actually reach people out of kabul and actually gain uh, the trust uh, or like you know focus on people that have been left out especially women it's time for us to start focusing on programs uh, larger than like you know promote uh, just to name one and you know things like that don't work in afghanistan's context maybe start working and focusing on things like we don't have uneducated women maybe focus on edu- uh, uneducated women and their literacy and alternative ways to employ them maybe focus on mne and develop um, routine checkups on those areas or like spin ball that like jari like megwan and maybe start focusing on funding innovative projects that can sustain themselves and at the end of the, the this whole remarks thing i would focus on one thing stop treating afghanistan as a project afghanistan is not a project women rights are not a project women are not a project we are just as equal as involved in afghanistan as everyone else is and maybe it's time that we focus on sustaining women rights and empowered women who have been on ground who have worked on ground and who know that even if when us withdraws maybe not today maybe after 10 years 20 years let's say maybe by then we have a sustainable system for ourselves and we don't 
rely a lot, as Mr. Sopko said, on funds, on monetary funds, because uh, enough is enough. It has been two decades and we still rely on everything, on international community. And maybe that's the reason that our women are so left out of the whole thing, because they still depend on uh, the government and the government that is as corrupt as uh, the Taliban. They, like there is no difference between the two. So we need to have this um, sustainability in mind and we need to stop treating everything like a project within Afghanistan. We need to move forward from that. A very powerful and, and strong uh, statement. Thank you so much, Bashtana. We are just doing all we can to uh, see if we can get uh, Belkis back online and, and hear her very important perspectives on uh, uh, efforts to develop uh, economic opportunities for women in rural areas uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so uh, as soon as we manage, uh, if we manage, hopefully, I will bring her into the conversation. But meanwhile, uh, let me stay with you, Pashtana, uh, please. Um, so you know, we heard in the prior remarks about the threat that uh, Taliban poses, certainly to uh, the level of uh, protect, certainly to, to rights and protections as they uh, currently exist uh, under the Afghan constitution. Uh, something the Taliban wants to uh, change in uh, negotiations, although it's not, uh, uh, there is no um, explicit um, uh, detailed uh, articulation of what changes uh, would take place. But you operate um, uh, in wide parts of the country, including rural areas. Can you give us some examples of uh, what uh, life uh, is for women in areas with strong Taliban presence, such as in um, rural Helmand or uh, rural Kandahar. Um, what kind of practical material differences does it mean to live in Lashkarga, for example, versus living in Nadia Ali? Please. So uh, I would uh, like, you know, uh, I remember going to like, you know, spin ball deck with this one lady back in the day, like a year ago, she had cancer and she was from Lashkarga. So it was taxi and she was sitting by my side and we got, like she was going to Koita for uh, um, like in her surgery probably. And, um, you know, the other women is with her and I, she, she asked me if I had some money to give her because she couldn't afford the going through the border and to Koita. And it was around 500 Fs. And so we kept, we started talking and we talk and I asked her like, you know, what's the reason that you are going to Koita instead of like, you know, all these uh, good hospitals that we have here. And she tells me that getting into these hospitals would cost me more rather than going to Koita. And that made me realize that our ruler woman in Lashkarga is so scared of going to a hospital in Kandahar in the city would rather go to a country that is hostile to refugees and Afghans rather than going to the main city and the hospital. For the reason that I'm giving you this uh, utterly irrelevant example is because this is how women are actually within Afghanistan. Now I'm going to give you an, another example of Barani. She's my third uh, cousin. If I can just uh, clarify, what was she afraid of? Was she afraid of uh, having to pay at checkpoints to warlords? Or was she afraid that the Taliban would kill her if she traveled on the road? Did, did she give you any details? It was all about like, you know, getting into a hospital, paying for extra uh, money because the hospital is public. You don't. You are not supposed to pay anything. But you are. But within our hospitals, it's so corrupt that you have to pay one way or the other. The second thing that she was most afraid of that we don't have that capacity. Let's be honest. Twenty years, all these doctors, all that investment, and we don't have uh, capable doctors even today that can handle cases like that. A normal case like TB or normal case like uh, uh, lower uh, ranges of chemotherapy, right? The second thing, the second example I would give you is of Barani. She's my third cousin. She lives in Maruf. She is probably now 19. She was married off uh, when she was 15 and she was married to an Afghan National Army uh, officer. And uh, so the so her husband died on on the ground and in, on the battlefield and he was brought back and he was buried. And then after that, she was kept she kept on getting threats from her own family and she kept on like, you know, uh, getting beaten up her children and herself uh, within her in-laws. So she went to the city, she came to the tribal leaders and she kept on living at our house. The one reason was 
she lived under the Taliban uh, like Taliban regime. So she cannot go on and ask someone else to provide her with the justice. But at the same time, the men are so powerful, she cannot challenge them back. So there is these two narratives. You know, you live under the Taliban control, you cannot ask questions back. That's one side. But if you come to the city, you still cannot ask the government to help you because the first thing the government is going to tell you is like, you come from a Taliban controlled area. What are you doing here? The second thing is you are a woman, they're probably going to group you. I'm being very honest right now. That's what happens when you go to uh, public offices. The third thing is her only option was going to an institute which is like thousands of years old to a jirga to get her case resolved to stop her from getting beaten up daily so that she could go back with her orphans to the same village which was under the Taliban control. So do you get the whole narrative of being uh, under the Taliban control and at the same time not have been able to access that one institute that has been made for you because at the end of the day they're also corrupt so it's like you know both ways you are going down anyways so yeah that's how it goes for Afghan for women in southern afghanistan uh, so if i can um, ask you a little bit about the issue of schooling that um, kate raised um, and just about all of our um, interlocutors highlighted um you know, there is a big uncertainty as to whether the Taliban envisions um, uh, a, a rule like in the 1990s, extremely backward, doctrinal, brutal, that literally locked women uh, inside uh, household compounds if it did not brutally beat them or execute them on the streets. And what we hear consistently from um, uh, Taliban interlocutors, certainly at the level of leadership, is that they understand uh, that um, they cannot and, and don't want to act like in the 1990s. That said, uh, as we also heard the execution uh, of uh, any kind of um, edicts uh, and preferences from Keta Shura or Peshawar Shura, it often varies. But nonetheless, it appears that rather consistently, we are seeing the Taliban uh, allowing girls to participate in schooling, at least through pu uh, puberty. Uh, we are perhaps seeing, um, um, or at least until puberty, I should say, we are at least seeing uh, less um, uh, determination to, to directly destroy schools, even if, um, uh, of course, insecurity and Taliban instigated fighting just as uh, um, fighting instigated by the government or, uh, um, or others uh, pre prevents children from going to school because people are um, afraid to go to school in the context of violence. But we also hear narratives that the Taliban, um, for example, makes sure that teachers are at school, that it cracks down on corruption, that if teachers have more than one job, that the teacher actually shows up uh, in school and the Taliban prevents that level of corruption even if Taliban representatives restrict what kind of uh, classes, uh, what kind of text is being taught. Uh, please give us your perspective of, on how those, uh, the, those perceptions or, or at least those anecdotes that we hear are consistent or different from what you had seen with respect to education and Taliban's um, current uh, enforcement or Taliban's current rule on the ground. So, okay, yeah, I'm on, on, mute, on, on mute. So I'm going to give you a very irrelevant example again. Uh, last year, it was Women's Day, and there were a few women who have been in the government now for like, you know, two decades. So they schooled during the Taliban time. And... Um, in the underground schools. And, um, you know, because I was three years old when the Americans came, so I don't remember anything. I wouldn't claim that I, I have been through that hell. So they, they kept on talking and these are two deputy ministers and one is like, you know, the um, uh, spokesman for the president. And the one says that uh, it, uh, if the Taliban come, at least women won't be getting raped. And uh, what happened during the Mujahideen time. And I, 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 I had this, you know, this, in my mind, it was all about like, you know, Taliban are the bad people. So how come they are saying that women won't get raped? But if you see the narrative, if you go around, if you ask the public, there is one thing about Taliban, you get fast justice with them, uh, you get uh, fair justice with them, like, you know, under the Sharia or what they call the Sharia. And also, yes, with the narratives where schools are open, they have made sure that uh, teachers do go there. Um, 
like you know you have to be honest about certain things like on one hand we have the government that has infrastructures and that is like literally stealing teachers salary from the teachers and is using it for their own mega projects and then there's on other hand the taliban uh, who are literally cutting women's noses but at the same time they are making sure that teachers do stand in schools right so you have to accept that reality yes uh, even i have heard at the moment that even within my district Right now, the Taliban have agreed to open schools for girls, but until they hit puberty. But after that, they cannot you know, go to school or go to a public space. So that is one reality and that has happened. But at the same time, like, you know, you do see a lot of, uh, like, you know, traditionally within our communities, girls don't go to schools a lot. And I would be very honest about the fact that many people say that it's not of no use to go to school for a girl. And that's the reason that don't a lot of girls don't go to school so again the narrative is different but at the same time um like in Helmand, uh, taliban have been burning down schools and they have been uh, like you know torturing teachers they have been stopping people who have even smartphones to teach girls or to teach uh, students but at the same time in maruf then again we have heard that there is like you know um this narrative where taliban do agree on letting men teach within like you know masjid or like you know with a public space so yeah that's that's that it goes on in different geographies. Thank you very much. Understanding this nuance is really fundamental um, uh, in being able to uh, implement and design uh, efforts to uh, promote women's rights and, and minimize or at least reduce uh, the challenges uh, for Afghan women and men, uh, as well as for the international community. I would also posit um, that uh, much broader engagement and focus on Afghan men. So they become promoters of Afghan women uh, uh, is really fundamental and often lacking uh, in our efforts that appropriately focus on women, but perhaps not completely wisely solely focus on, on Afghan women. Kate, let me come to you. There are very many questions from the audience uh, as to what um, the international community, the United States can do to guarantee uh, women's rights in Afghanistan. And, and we heard uh, uh, General Allen, Mr. Sopko, you speak about um, conditionality, strict conditionality. Uh, but let me, th there are also questions that, I, that we haven't yet heard and that I very much welcome um, um, your thoughts, which is how can the international community and the United States uh, better deal with the corruption misbehavior uh, that government linked uh, uh, personalities inflict on Afghan um, women? There's a whole set of questions uh, to that effect how to um, uh, better uh, protect human rights uh, against government officials or those linked with government officials. Um, another question that I'm seeing is, uh, how can the United States better deal with the corruption that so hurt Afghan women? So uh, on the government side, how can we do better than we have been um, uh, doing in the past 20 years? And, and particularly, um, if uh, um, uh, the United States does not stay engaged in Afghanistan for another five or 20 years? Yes, it's a, it's a huge question. Um, uh, I think I, I want to mention that it was something that came up in the, in the field interviews that we commissioned, um, which are, of course, not nationally representative, but, um, but everyone we spoke to said you, you should, if you can, you have to do this because especially in rural areas, women just don't have the channels to, you know, get their views across, uh, our women and men. Um, but, but both, we found both women and men, um, interestingly, you know, did many people distinguished between the, you know, the U.S. military presence and the civilian side. And then when they talked about the development efforts, they would, they'd often um, be very positive about, you know, we know that, that U.S. efforts have made a big difference for, you um, uh, for women and girls, and they often uh, mentioned education as the biggest component of that. But they, then they would, um, and they several people have pointed a finger at, you know, said we Afghans ourselves um, have prevented some of that assistance from like being, you know, fairly reaching people. That the, our own corruption has, you know, interfered with your efforts. And um, so it was, it was interesting to see that and. I mean, as far as what we can do about it, 
We, we also have a lessons learned report on US anti-corruption efforts, um, which is now a few years old, but um, still relevant to this question. And I think um, we can, of course, conditionality is one of the tools again, um, we have not used it, uh, you know, perhaps as, as uh, narrowly as we might have, as, you know, as uh, targeted in a very targeted way. And we're often, uh, you know, the pressure to, Sigar has talked um, many times about the pressure to spend um, budgets is the, the structural incentives for US agencies spending money in Afghanistan is often not to withhold $50 million or withhold $100,000 uh, because the incentive is to, to spend so that you get the same amount the next year. Um, so there's some structural things in our own house that we could do, you know, in the US side that we could do to put more incentives in place to actually carry out uh, conditionality and more tools to carry it out. Um, uh, we saw one example uh, within the security forces where uh, I believe was two or three years ago, um, there was money withheld because of a lack of the um, biometric um, you know, uh, data to confirm the numbers, uh, the numbers of, of service members in the ANA and the Afghan National Army and some amount was withheld so that we were not um, funding the, you know, paying the salaries of so-called ghost soldiers. Um, so conditionality could be um, better in, employed, I think. Uh, but then it's also about supporting Afghan actors themselves in civil society to to be watchdogs, to be um, to to be empowered and have the funding and support to hold their own government accountable. Um, so I think some of those longer term efforts are are just about the U.S. Um, keeping this on the agenda as well in our interactions with the Afghan government and helping to empower civil society to take their own, um, uh, you know, to, to help shift the norms really um, in Afghanistan. So, so unfortunately, I have been very unhappy that we have not been able to get Belkis um, online, that um, indeed is the fate of uh, um, cell signal uh, in, uh, and Wi-Fi signal in Afghanistan, as it is for us even uh, in Washington, D.C. in the Zoom era. We do uh, suffer from um, Wi-Fi um, um, challenges at various times, but nonetheless, uh, uh, Belkil's uh, tremendous contributions on the ground uh, are enormous, even if she is not able to uh, share them with us today. Uh, but uh, let me stay with you, Kate, and then uh, ask the same question to Pashtana. So one of the areas I was um, really keen to hear uh, Belkis about was uh, particularly generating jobs. A topic that we have raised is fundamental jobs for women. Uh, um, does your report look at that uh, at all, and particularly jobs outside of the public sector? So women um, have been able to access jobs in government, which is uh, uh, tremendous. Uh, the, the presence of women, including young women, uh, in uh, Afghan government uh, role is unprecedented, often because there are explicit um, uh, quota for um, female um, uh, job holders. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is, of course, not the case in the private sector, where uh, similar quotas uh, cannot be equally ac uh, accessed and where social pressures are much harder. What thoughts or lessons uh, either of you, starting with you, Kate, have on um, job opportunities um, for women? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I would have, uh, I'm glad you asked this question. I think it's it's right up there with the importance of health and education. but. Um, uh, we we did look at the private sector. Um, we found, as you said, greater successes in terms of the the trends and the portion of women, or the portion of jobs that women have secured have been greater on the the gains are greater on the, in the public sector um, certainly, but in the private sector there are more women owned businesses um, than 20 years ago. Uh, but the 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 absolute number it, you know has grown and that's great and and that means thousands of you know, women's lives and their families have been changed and I don't want to discount that but at the same time the 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 you know size of the increase I mean the purport, proportionally the size of the increase is still very very small and there and and women business owners you might say remain um, a small elite group 
And, um, and then the other side of this is in on manufacturing, women remain um, a majority of the labor force in manufacturing. I think it's 65% um, was a figure a few years ago. Um, but the problem is that manufacturing includes the lowest pain, some of the lowest pain and um, least secure jobs, um, meaning, you know, most volatile. And, and so there haven't, you know, we don't see that as a, as an engine of, you know, that hasn't seemed to be an engine of economic empowerment in the last 20 years. Um, uh, I also want to mention the overall, the, uh, we have the figure in the report, but the overall, the poverty rate in Afghanistan has actually slightly increased compared to, I think, 2006, seven. So overall, the availability of jobs is, has, is actually shrinking and what, and you have 400,000 Afghans entering the labor force every year. What does that mean in a country where a man is expected to be the breadwinner and his, and his honor, you know, if the woman is, if women are seen as a symbol of you know, the honor of the family and the nation, like a man's honor is also linked to his ability to provide for his family. So uh, if there are only so many jobs available, there are already, you know, many social and cultural norms uh, restricting what jobs are available to women. Well, absolutely. And we haven't touched on a fundamental issue, which is COVID, that has uh, dramatically increased poverty and economic distrust, uh, which will be translating in far greater effects on women uh, than on men in very many ways. But it also amplifies the challenge of uh, fewer jobs, meaning greater competition and potentially uh, significant consequences in terms of uh, the willingness of Afghan men to allow women uh, to compete um, for jobs. So, um, uh, but uh, Pashtana, uh, uh, you know, quickly to you with that same questions of economic empowerment. And I'll also give you uh, one additional, the last question before thanking the whole panel. And the last question, in addition to the economic jobs and opportunities for you is, from your perspective, um, uh, as a very impressive, accomplished young Afghan woman, what is the best uh, role that the international community can uh, have, the United States perhaps directly can have in supporting uh, progress uh, for women? Please. Thank you so much. So uh, I would start with the economic opportunities. Uh, as Kate said that uh, there are like, you know, the, uh, the unemployment rate is like, you know, been uh, higher than now than it was back in the day, like uh, before in 2015 or 2014. So uh, I would uh, I would also want to highlight on the fact that, you know, there are a few certain things that you would uh, want to highlight as an, uh, a youth or young girl that uh, I see a lot of private sector uh, companies, they do like to take in women more and um, or at least like, you know, have that ratio per, uh, which is equality within Kabul or Kandahar like there is a lot of uh, what or like you know you go to organizations you meet people there's always a woman in leadership position so that is one thing that we should be like you know um like actually talking about and appreciating that that has happened over the course of years or the course of a different policies or quotas that have been implemented through the international community. So that is something to be appreciated and celebrated. Of course, there's a lot to be done, but this is like, you know, the starting uh, or like, you know, the initial stage. And the second thing is, I feel like um, with SMEs, as Belki said uh, yesterday, is we need to focus on empowering women within our own context. I mean, like, uh, yes, it's it's a good thing to empower women uh, with the fact that uh, you know the money comes for women but how about you empower women within her own context as a, a, a community member or a social leader because that's what we are we are a very social uh, and communal um, communities in Afghanistan uh, where we know we go to each other's houses we go to each other's uh, you know funerals we go to each other's weddings everything is communal so how about we make uh, employment communal for women so that is it's accepted more, it's more uh, uh, welcomed within Afghanistan and it has happened before and it can happen again and there are a lot of projects that have been working and that have uh, been successful but I would strongly highlight uh, like you know uh, uh, talk about the fact that we need to stop uh, focusing on the fact that 
women empowerment is not an issue here everyone wants to uh, like you know have that uh, be the breadwinner or everyone wants to share the burden we need to stop with the fact that we need to empower women we need to stop making afghan women like you know from be being a victim to heroes we need to stop doing that we need to just live our gender lives we need to have our normal jobs we need to have our normal salaries that's how afghanistan is going to sustain we don't need high end projects we don't need a lot of money we need just a sustainability and stop treating everything like projects and um, on your second questions as you said what us can do is um like for us and the international community my my recommendation as a, as an educator is like probably focus more on education not only girls education on a very lower area like primary or elementary education but uh, how about you introduce programs with skills apart from embroidery apart from making chutneys or like you know pickles how about practical skills this is time for afghanistan to like try agriculture wise uh, other um, uh, department in the department wise and the say a third thing is most importantly um, let's focus on communities as communities let's focus on empowering uh, leaders within our communities let's empowering uh, let's start empowering civil society from rural areas let's stop hand picking people from elite or uh, high end circles who come from abroad take out places and then i sound a lot like conservatives right now sorry for that that they are taking our jobs no i don't mean like that but what i mean is like you know what what afghans need right now is to take charge of their own start taking responsibility and start showing up for their work start showing up for their uh, works that they are assigned to because this is our time and if we need to stop like you know if we need to have that equal quota within the peace talks we need to start showing up we need to start serving our own country and that's the most important thing we can do as as people as nation and as young women in afghanistan right now Well, thank you so much for the very powerful words and uh, empowering words. You know, the the theme of agency of Afghan people, of Afghan women, uh, is uh, perhaps uh, the most important theme from my perspective to to emphasize steadily. Uh, and thank uh, very much, also many thanks very much, also to um, uh, Kate, uh, to Mr. Sopko, and to General Allen uh, for your analysis, uh, your. Um, uh, excellent comments and your dedication to Afghanistan. And finally, very many thanks to the audience. Uh, I channeled, bundled many of the questions that came into broad themes that we discussed. Thank you for the participation and we look forward to seeing you at Brookings uh, at uh, further events. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.